The Rhode Island Comic Con! Welcome to the 2021 Rhode Island Comic Con here in Providence, Rhode Island. My name is David Ciccarella, where we're going to talk to special guests and see a lot of amazing things at Rhode Island Comic Con. I'm now here with one of the best comedy duos ever on film, Brian O'Halloran, Jeff Anderson, Dante Randall from the Clerks films. How are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? Brian, you're back again. Yes, I'm like uh, chlamydia. I come back every once in a while. So uh, until they take the shot, I'm coming back. Um, but seriously, though, uh, it's always fun coming back, you know, with the cancellation of last year. And now they've invited us back. And they finally listened to me by inviting the rest of the people from the movie. So. Jeff, welcome to Rhode Island Comic Con. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm probably going to get Brian banned from here. He's been here for like six years. He finally brings me, and I think he's done. Who was some of your favorite comedy duos growing up? Oh, well, the comedy stylings of C-3PO and R2-D2. I mean, come on. No. Uh, you know, I'm an Abbott and Costello, the Honeymooners. You know, the, there's those classic comedy. That's the stuff I grew up with my dad. Judge Judy and her uh, bailiff bird. I love those two. I'm a big fan. I'm waiting for Judy on DVD, and I heard she's got a new show and she left Bird out. Apparently Bird charges too much money. I don't know, but they are always my favorite. When it comes to Kevin mastering what comedy duos are, that's it. And this is, you know, Dante and Randall are the clerk he was and the clerk he wishes he was written into this these two characters. Do you feel that when Kevin writes more for Dante and Randall, a little bit of your personalities are more into roles now as the time goes by? No, because I'm actually more of a Randall than a Dante, and he's more of a Dante than a Randall. I'm not even supposed to be here today. Did that sound, did that sound like him? I'm not even supposed to be here today. Would have been a better movie, wouldn't it? <laughs> you guys are well, like, thank no, God they got that right. How does it feel to be an action figure? Well, first off, to correct your nomenclature, these are inaction figures, because there's one thing that we don't do is action. If you've seen any Kevin Smith films, there is no action. So these represent us perfectly. It's, uh, you know, as a kid growing up with, you know, Looney Tunes and Star Wars figures and things like that, this was uh, a part of our career that I was like, holy crap, we've made ourselves into toys. So it's good. I love it. People have been asking us about Clerks 3, and we're not supposed to say anything, but this is Clerks 3. Oh, you're saying too much dialogue. That's it. You're That's it. Too much dialogue. It's just another Clerks movie, just us standing there. Now, you revealed something to me. I'm not sure if I can say anything. But something about Randall and his hat. Randall gets a magic hat. It's a sombrero. It's a wizard hat. No, Clerks 3, the first time we'll see Randall without a hat. The only other time was in the cartoon. In the cartoon, yes. Does Randall have hair? I don't know. <laughs> and that's the difference between Jeff and Randall is flipping your hat back. Yeah, yeah. I turn it around and I'm Jeff, I flip it this way and chew gum and I'm Randall. How was it being back at the Quick Stop in New Jersey filming Clerks 3? It was once again really odd in the sense that nothing has changed about it. Uh, secondly, when we first did the first Clerks, there was only four people in the store at any given time. This had an actual crew of like 20 people inside the store, which then we were like, oh my God, get these people out of the store. How are we supposed to make this movie? Uh, it was cool. It was uh, very reminiscent. Jeff will tell you as well that there was a good half an hour of just me and him and Kevin and Jay just going and just taking it in again that we're 
here in this building again. If someone said, hey, you know, in 28 years, you'll be back in this stupid building doing another one, and we'd be like, this is really what we mounted to? Just doing the same stupid trick again and again? You know, being in the store, like Brian said, that store never changes. But the most amazing part of it is now they sell like pot memorabilia, pot stuff, paraphernalia. They got pot pipes in there and rolling paper. So the store has become so much more fun. <laughs> and recreating your old scenes. And recreating the old scenes, oh boy. This has been a true gem talking to both of you at the same time. One of my favorite groups, Clerks is one of my favorite movies, so thank you. Brian O'Halloran, Jeff Anderson. You've had the Clerks at the same time. I'm now here with Scott Schaffo from Clerks, and how are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? I'm having a wonderful time, sir. This is really rocking this year. Okay, well, big news is you're going to be in Clerks 3. To be able to come back after 20 some odd years and revisit that character in a really fun, odd way, which I think most of the fans know the premise of the overall uh, film is it's a film within a film. So the opportunity to do some really fun stuff, it's kind of like I'm playing the actor that played the actor of Julie's. It's, that's how meta it is. It's really bizarre. And how does it feel to have Chuli's gum finally? It's mind-blowing. I, I never dreamed eventually there would actually be the real Chuli's. He wanted to have it on the counter for the third film. So he, he made it, and now people are loving it. It's bizarre. A lot of your cast members are here today. You had no scenes with Jeff Anderson, you know, Randall. Did you guys ever meet when you were filming the first Clerks film? No, we did not. Very briefly, just in passing, I didn't get to spend any time around Jeff. I never got to know Jeff until recently. I'm in a, in the third one, I could say, pretty much all the main people are in the scene with me. And now that Jeff's out doing the cons, I got to know him and meet him. He's a sweetheart of a guy. No, I never really got to uh, connect with Jeff in the original. Do, does your character ever get a fir actual first name? No, no name, no name at all. We don't know who he is. He's just a, he's a crazy, I'll tell you, he's a crazy method actor. That much I could tell you. So just like Scott Chaffel himself? Pretty much. <laughs> now that Clerks 3 is gonna come out soon, what do you think that means for Kevin Smith? Although it's got a number in the title, it's a sequel, Clerks 3, it can stand alone. And I do think people that find it as a standalone are going to embrace it and then go back. So I truly believe he's going to end up with a whole new league of fans. There's so much that people could dig into, especially if they're new to it, you know? So it's just all good. It's all a blessing. And I have the fans to thank. So thank you guys and thank you. Now I'm standing with? Ahsoka Tano. And what brings you to Rhode Island Comic Con? All of the Star Wars cosplays and the 501st Rebel Legion. Also her voice actors here. It's been fun. You're orange? Yes. What type of Star Wars in the universe, what aliens are orange? The Tergruda, but also the Twi'leks are, they're also a variety of colors, and there's many more. I have my sabers and my Jedi food capsules, and that's pretty much all I need. That's right, you're a Jedi. Yes. Wow. Who trained you? Master Skywalker. Wow, that's really cool. That's amazing. And who do you have, who's, who's this guy behind us? This is IG-88. He's a bounty hunter droid. <laughs> I'm now with Trevor Furman. How are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? It's super fun. It's great. And you're with a lot of your clerks castmates. How does that feel? Uh, I hate them, but you know, it's well, I enjoy it for the fans. No, I, they're they're awesome. I love hanging out with them. They're super cool. You're back in Clerks Three. How does it feel to be Elias once again? Great, weird for sure. Like I haven't been in show business for you know 15 years, so it's strange to just kind of come back and dust off the dust off the character, but it was super fun too. I mean, it was like real walk down memory lane and you know, it was cool. How is it being in New Jersey where they filmed the first film? I love Jersey, it's beautiful. I loved the crew there. They were mostly like a New York crew, but I made a lot of good friends on the crew and everybody that I met in New Jersey was super nice. Um, and yeah, great food, it was great. Were you working on a Jay and Silent Bob video game? Yeah, I'm st we're still producing it. It's called Jan's Island Bob Chronic Blunt Punch by the studio in Terrabang Entertainment. And how is it being directed by Kevin? He's an awesome person. He's a pretty much exactly 
you know, who he seems to be when he does his, his talks and things like that. He's uh, really nice, really smart, really fast, really funny. I'm now here with Kevin Weissman. How are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. You know, it just started today. Met some great people. Uh, just flew in from L.A. Sat next to Tony Dow on the plane from Leave it to Beaver. Big fan. My mother was very excited. I called her and let her know that Tony was here. Really sweet guy. There's a clerk's reunion I'm sure you've heard about. So it's been great connecting with Trevor and Jason, the rest of the cast. Yeah, it's been nice to, to reunite. How is it being directed by Kevin Smith? He would kind of throw a lot of new lines my way, mid-scene, which I like. Kind of keeps you fresh, keeps the material fresh. And he was open to my, my suggestions as well. So it was really a nice collaboration. Great guy. I have an eighth grader, and that movie is very popular with my middle school daughter and her friends. I don't think they should be watching it. Now that I think about it, it's bad parenting. <laughs> There's a lot of bad words in there. You worked on Hello Ladies with Stephen Merchant. How is that experience? What do you think the legacy of the show is? Well, Hello Ladies was a show on HBO in uh, 2014, created by the great Stephen Merchant, about a group of guys trying to meet women and be successful in Los Angeles and failing miserably. It was kind of like the anti-entourage. And uh, it's still streaming on HBO. So if you haven't seen it, uh, check it out. Really funny and sweet. and. Steven's a genius. You know, he created The Office with Ricky Gervais, and he is a, an incredible, incredible comic mind. So again, just like Kevin, being able to collaborate with someone that talented, and it was really a, a, a special time in my life. So we did one season and a wrap-up movie, and I'm really proud of it. I think we still get a lot of people like Clerks, that new generations of people that are watching it. And what are you currently working on? Marvel's Runaways, which is on Hulu and Disney+, Plus, and it's based on a comic by Brian K. Vaughn. It's about a group of teens who find out that they have these superpowers and they also find out their parents are part of an evil organization that is secretly running LA and I play one of the one of the parents who creates uh, a dinosaur who, who uh, my daughter can telepathically communicate with. So it's, uh, it's a really cool Marvel show and you can check that out. Now I'm standing with Captain America, a.k.a. Gianna. <laughs> nice to meet you all. <laughs> nice to meet you and what inspired you to just like Captain America today? Um, he is my favorite Marvel superhero, and I just wanted to do the female version, essentially. But I guess I could be Captain Carter, too, from the What If. Yeah, so we are Studio C, booth 207. We're a mother-daughter kind of duo here. It's our first con, actually. So we're super excited to be here. It's been a great weekend so far. Oh, that's fantastic. Now you have, let's, get, let's come over a little closer here. You have some of these uh, uh, snow globes. Yeah, so my mom actually makes all of those from the different superheroes, couple Disney ones. Try to cater to everyone, you know, in time for Christmas. <laughs> and and let's just go over here real quick. Sure. You have you have. I hope nobody with Superman's near near you. I know, right? Yeah, we do have the infamous Kryptonite here as well. So hopefully, no Superman get over here, or they'll be in trouble. But. <laughs> Well, that's why I think you decided to dress as uh, Captain America, not exactly. Superman. Exactly. Got to stick with the uh, Marvel versus DC characters for today. <laughs> now I'm with Tony Dow and Jerry Mathers, Wally and Beaver from the iconic Leave it to Beaver TV show. Ken Osman, the legendary Eddie Haskell, passed away recently. Could you share some memories working with Ken and the character of Eddie Haskell? Well, I mean, he's one of the great TV characters of all times, along with Archie Bunker and uh, the Fonz and, you know. So, uh, and, and he was pretty straight, you know. He's a conservative guy. He was a policeman, you know. So he did a great job in the show, and it was fun working with him. And it was fun going out to lunch with him, too. He was just a really nice person, a great mentor. You know, he knew a lot of people, and he was just such a wonderful fellow, and he just passed away way too soon. How was it coming back to Wally and Beaver, and still the Beaver, and playing the characters as fathers? Well, I was a little apprehensive about that because, you know, but I thought it was really cool when I stepped back and looked at it that you're actually seeing the show in three different uh, ways. You're seeing it in the 50s when Jerry and I were kids, seeing it in the 80s there was a movie of the week that we both had kids. Well it's just a really good show and it's a show that a whole family can sit down and watch and if you're a 
a parent, you know that there's nothing that's going to embarrass you or that you don't want your kids to know. I'm now with a WWE legend, a pro wrestling legend, Jerry the King Lawler. How are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? I've had a great time. It's been awesome. Uh, the fans have been great. The crowd's been tremendous. Uh, great company. People, this is the Honky Tonk Man. But a lot of people don't realize this. Wayne Ferris, Honky Tonk Man, is my first cousin. His mother and my mother are sisters. So we're sitting right next to each other. Two people here that I wanted to meet, I've never met in my life, and I've been a fan my whole life, Wally and the Beaver. Yeah, Jerry Mathers and Tony Dow are upstairs, and I got to, I got to not only just meet him, got to sit in the green room and talk with him and everything. So I've, I've had a great time. Now, you were recently on WWE Hidden Treasures. Yes. How was that experience being on that? Well, it was good. I mean, we filmed a lot of, it took a long time, I and mean, we filmed a lot of stuff with uh, AJ, my, the buddy that was the host of the show. I guess we did so much that a lot of it didn't get used. I mean, we, we stuffed him down in the Robin seat of my Batmobile, and we drove all around Memphis for like three hours filming stuff of he and I riding around in my Batmobile, and not any of that footage made it on the show. I mean, you know, what all we accomplished on there, they got my, my very first King's robe for the museum, and then, of course, we found Andy Kaufman's original neck brace, which was awesome. It was a lot of fun, and especially the main thing that was fun was getting a $20,000 check at the end of it for my robe. That is pretty good. Now, yeah. you have a new Funko Pop and WWE Elite action figures. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Funko Pop that just came out last month. And uh, it seems like every person that has come through the line here at the Comic-Con has a Funko Pop for me to sign, which is not a bad thing. How does it feel to be an action figure? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it, was, it was really uh, exciting at first when I, the very first action figure came out. But that's been many years ago, probably... 20 something years ago my first action figure but yeah the first time that i walk down the, the aisle in walmart or target or something and see yourself on the rack as an action figure that's a special feeling believe me i recently heard an old promo you did uh -oh. after andy kaufman passed away do you still have those same feelings you know there's a lot of rumors about if andy really dead or not yeah. I, don't, I don't think he's dead would you like to see andy I would. Would you like to see Andy today? Yes. You got a flashlight and a couple shovels? <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway, uh, no, I, I loved Andy Kaufman. He, be, he and I became great friends, and he was the best thing that ever happened to my career. I'm now with a pro wrestling legend, the one, the only, Honky Tonk Man. How are you feeling being at the Rhode Island Comic Con? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, this is a great event. I've always, you know, every time it, it, it's happening, I want to be here and be part of it. This year I was able to come up and it's been fabulous. It's been really, really fun. I'm an older generation wrestler from several years back and, and the, the older crowd comes in and they say, man, I remember you and I remember this and I remember that. So it brings enjoyment to them and that's what's fun. And how was it being inducted by your peers? You know, it's a, it was a great honor. It took 40 years almost to get there, and and uh, you, sometimes you think it's never going to happen. Sometimes you think, well, maybe it's this year, and then pretty soon you just say, well, the heck with it. It ain't ever going to happen. But it did, and it was fun, and I enjoyed going back and, and being part of the event. If you have any quick stories to share with working with the great late Roddy Piper. We had some fun together, and Roddy was a great entertainer. He was fabulous. He could just talk, 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 and say things right off the top of his head. Just a great guy. And one other person, Mean Gene Okerlund. Any memories of Mean Gene? I can't say enough about Mean Gene. He was one of those guys that when I would be doing an interview or I'd say something, he could take the microphone, drop it, and catch it, and then go, you know, and make this face and do these things. But he was one of the best. You, you think about the My Pillow guy on TV all the time. Think about if Mean Gene was doing those commercials. Gene could sell a show. He could sell an event. The only one that came close to Gene selling an event was a guy named Howard Finkel. Yeah, and Howard was fabulous at doing that. I'm now standing with John Bradshaw Layfield, one of the most iconic pro wrestlers of all time. How are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? So far, I'm having a great time. You know, me and Ron Simmons came to Rhode, uh, Rhode Island many, many times. We went to the Friendly Tap many times and destroyed a bar many times. So I may get had to call Ron and get into a bar fight tonight. I'm not sure. How did it feel when you changed from Bradshaw to JBL and changed that gimmick? Uh, one was world champion, so uh, one made a lot more money. 
<laughs> so I loved it. What's one of your favorite feuds in WWE? I had several. I, I enjoyed almost every person that, that I got the privilege to step in the ring with. Uh, you know, I got to wrestle Shawn Michaels at his prime and, and several times uh, during my career. Uh, Undertaker, Eddie Guerrero is probably my favorite of all time. Uh, but, you know, I had a great time with a lot of great talent. There was some incredible talent in the era that I was there, and I'm glad I got to get in the ring with these guys. How was it being inducted in WWE Hall of Fame? That was a dream come true, going to the Hall of Fame. You know, I, I grew up a wrestling fan. I wanted to be a wrestler. I wanted to be a world champion since I was a kid. And to go in the Hall of Fame was a dream come true. Now I'm here with... Hello, my name is Loki. I hope you'll be voting for me this November. Well, what do you have in your on your arm? Ah. I've got an alligator, Loki. He's my friend. Don't worry. We're actually, he's just numbing on it. Hand's still here. <laughs> he's your friend. I could tell. Wow. And yeah. uh, what happened to your, why are you all tattered up like this? Oh, uh, well, you see, I was, uh, I was minding my own business. I was running for president. And then these random people stepped through this doorway and they threw me to the end of time. Thankfully, I was able to find my way back. Well, to New Hampshire, no less. Yes. Uh, it's a nice area. There's a lot of old, old style buildings here and there. Awesome. And uh, what, tell me a little bit about your crown. Ah, yes. Well, see, most Lokis like to have a nice big crown. I figured for something that'll fit for the cameras, a little smaller. That way you don't have to worry about the headspace so much. Now I'm with? Uh, Cassidy. <laughs> Why Cassidy? And who, who are you dressed as today? I am dressed as my own version of Loki. <laughs> and how is it your own version? Um, it's not like from the, it's not one of the ones from the, either the comic books or the TV show. I just did it based on what I had at home and my own personal aesthetic. Oh, that's great. So you, so you put it all together? I did, yes. And what inspired the green hair? Um, I just thought the costume needed some more green. That, that's fair. It's, it's mostly black at the moment. Right. And um, why is Loki one of your favorite characters? I just think he has a great character arc, and I think his costume is, design is really well done. Awesome. And you enjoy the TV show? I did, yes, very much. Awesome. Well, I guess you can call yourself a variant of Loki. I hope so, yeah. I'm now here with Ruby Soho on how are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? Oh my gosh, it's been a blast. I'm having the time of my life. Um, this is the first like Comic Con weekend I've ever done. Um, and I am having such a great time meeting fans. I got to do a panel and hang out. And it's just, it's really been a blast. So I'm, I'm very grateful to be here for sure. And how does it feel being AEW? Oh, it's the best. I have the best job in the whole wide world. I can't even complain. I love going to work every week. Um, and, you know, they allow us to come out and do these things to be able to get to know our fans. And we have the best fans in professional wrestling. So, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm a very lucky girl, for sure. And when you were part of the BWE, the Riot Squad was really fun to watch. I was a fan. How was it bonding with the other two girls? Uh, they're my sisters for, for life. I am godmother to Sarah's son, and I speak to Liv all the time, probably at least once a week. We try to keep in contact, so um, it's a bond that I am so grateful that I got to, to make, and two women that mean the absolute world to me. So, What was one of your favorite feuds in WWE? I, I really really enjoyed uh, working with Ronda Rousey, that's for sure. Um, but I have to say um, a lot of some of my favorite matches um, that I was able to be a part of was um, against Sasha and Bailey, um, two of the most incredible women uh, that I've ever been able to stand uh, across the ring from. I'm very big fans of both of them, so um, honored to be able to work with those girls for sure. I'm now here with Francine, an ECW superstar. How are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? Um, I, first of all, I like the word legend, so let's just get that straight. ECW legend, correct? No, I'm kidding. Um, my first time here, absolutely love it. Everybody has been so warm and welcoming, and I'm having a great time, and this weekend went by like that. Well, you were recently, I believe, in Massachusetts for the Major Wrestling Figure Podcast. How was it being part of that group? Oh my God, that was so much fun. And you have a micro brawler. How's that? I do. I do. The funny part is when um, they got me the micro brawler, uh, Brian Myers and Matt Cardona were nice enough to get me one. I didn't even know what it was. And they put it on the screen and they're like, look what we got you. And I just looking and I was like, don't know. And here it's a, it's a little action figure and I'm thrilled that I have one. And they sold out in less than a half hour, but we crashed the website when they were selling, so 300 of them went like that. She's so cute, she has big boobs, and she's really, really special, and I love her. How does it feel to be an action figure? Oh, it's it's amazing. I mean, I, I when I was in ECW, I didn't get an action figure. 
When I was in WWE, I didn't get an action figure. Two years ago, I got my first action figure from Figures Toy Company, and um, there might be a second one on the way. Uh, we'll stay tuned. But I never thought at 49 years old I'd be getting all of this stuff coming towards me. There's so much. And finally, what do you think the legacy of ECW is all these years later? Oh, everybody still talks about it, remembers it. There's a lot of, of great memories that I have, and doing these cons just brings that all back to me because the fans want to talk about it. It makes me happy. It makes them happy. So I am happy to reminisce, and um, ECW was the world to me, so I enjoyed my time there. And I'm just happy that other people enjoyed it as well. I'm now with Din Djarin, the Mandalorian. Wow. And what brings you to Rhode Island Comic Con? Well, I'm trying to find the people of this creature that I was charged to uh, take care of. You know its name? Uh, apparently, his name is Grogu. Now, I hear Mandalorians always wear their helmets, and why is that? Why do they barely ever take their helmets off? Once you put it on, you can, and if you take it off, you can never put it on again. I'm now here with... A, a custom Mandalorian, but my name is uh, Dakota Lyons. Hi, and uh, why are you custom Mandalorian? Why am I custom? Well, I mean, way back in the day, you know, when I fell in love with Star Wars, uh, Boba Fett, obviously my favorite character because he looks so cool. And then, uh, you know, middle school rolls around. I'm making my own cardboard Mandalorian armor, uh, you know, and then, you know, 12, 14 years later, now I got this. You know, if, if anybody's seen the, uh, the Mandalorian TV series, there's a huge emphasis on uh, individuality with the Mandalorian culture. And that's reflected in their armor and their paint schemes, like, so much. So, I mean, that's something you could bring straight into the cosplay, you know. And instead of your blasters, you have your Mountain Dews. I, I, yeah, I have a, I've got a Mountain Dew, i got a water. And I do have a blaster on my hip as well. It's just kind of hidden. <laughs> Make sure you stay hydrated first before using the blaster. Yes, of course. <laughs> I'm now with Chris Owen. How are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? I, <laughs> I literally, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually living in Boston. So I drove here. I'm excited to be in Providence. Super excited to be here at the con. Feeling good, man. Feeling good. Well, one of my favorite movies that you were a part of was Angus. Could you just talk about working on that movie with a director and the rest of the cast? The, the guy who played Angus, Charlie Talbert, was not an actor. He actually was living in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And the director, Patrick, was driving from castings. They were doing the major castings in like the major cities. And uh, he stopped off at a fast food restaurant because he needed some food while he, was, while he was driving. And he's waiting in line and he's like, what's going on here? Why isn't the line moving? Walks up to the front of it and there's Charlie who is like flirting with the, the, the cashier and holding up the line. And he's just like, I'm a director. You need to audition for my film. And Charlie's like, yeah, I don't believe you. He showed up, he auditioned, and they loved him. They flew him out to LA, had us hang out. They sent us to Disneyland to make sure that we could be friends, uh, which is an interesting choice. Um, but I guess if you can't be friends hanging out in Disneyland, you can't be friends at all. But yeah, we hit it off. And uh, we ended up making that movie, which um, was incredible. Uh, it's so funny, nobody knows that movie, but the cast on it is actually huge when you really look at it. Had a great time, and Charlie decided he wanted to be an actor after doing that film, and lived with me for years in Los Angeles. <laughs> so you two remain great friends. We don't talk as much as I'd like to anymore, but that kind of happens. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping he'll uh, come by uh, Boston and we can hang out soon. And of course, a lot of people know you from the American Pie movies. What do you think the legacy of those films are so many years later? It's, it's absolutely insane. Just from doing these con appearances now, where I've got these teenagers coming up and saying, you know, we love the film, it's really funny. And then the parents come up afterwards and, and want to get a picture as well. Like, it's become this generation, like, you know, that kind of classic, uh, almost in the vein of, like, you know, your Animal House and, and, and whatnot from the previous generation. I, I can't believe that here I am now, still talking about it, and, you know, uh, basically since 1990, they come out in 99, I think, uh, I've been the Shermanator everywhere I go.
for better or worse. I'm now with Joel David Moore, and how are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? Well, we just got here, but it's fantastic. You know, this is kind of the first time that I've done anything like this out of uh, outside of San Diego's Comic Cons. Tell us a little bit about your experience on Dodgeball. Generally, I loved it. It was really from anything that I've done. It was my introduction to how to make a movie because it was about a three-month shoot in Los Angeles predominantly, in, in Vegas a little bit, we had to travel for it. But you know, it was Justin Long and Vince and Ben Stiller and all these guys that I had known from TV and film, but I, it was my first gig. So you know, there was a lot of like me trying to learn the ropes and figure out what I was doing. I think I was like 25, and I was a young 25, I blossomed later. All in all, it was a, an amazing experience. You know, they took me under their wing and we had a blast. And now here, almost 20 years later, I'm, you know, made a career out of it. And you also worked with Steven Root on that film. How was Steven? Steve, I just talked to Steven. Uh, I do a lot of producing now, and he was in a film that I executive produced called Paint, Owen Wilson, a new Owen Wilson comedy coming out. Steven is just one of the most enjoyable people I've met in Los Angeles, in this industry. He is a fantastic person, he's a great human, he's an incredible actor, and he deserves all the success that he's had. And you were in Avatar? I was in Avatar. I was one of the leads in Avatar, yes. The rest of them as well. Long, long journey with Avatar. And how was it wearing that suit to be later on CGI'd? The suit is fun. The suit is fine. It's not, you know, like it's a, you're doing performance capture, so. Um, but it, it's, it's the great evener because like everybody is just in these suits so you all look super goofy so it doesn't matter. Like it's Zoe is in a suit, Sam's in a suit. We're all in suits and we just come together. Uh, it's sort of like going to black box uh, theater again, you know, like where you just, you're just imagining the surroundings. Um, so it really creates a fun, creative environment. Yeah, we love it. And how was, what was your reaction like when you saw the film finished for the first time? Oh my God. Probably my greatest most enthused that I've been because we put a lot of time into that work you know traditionally you're not you're not shooting a movie that long you're kind of uh, you know you're two three months into a film and that's about it um, this one was uh, two, two years plus really in making it and then the sequels uh, are, are long shoots as well you know you just have to put that much time in to make the kind of behemoth you know film that Jim Cameron wants to make so uh, look, it was, a, it was a true blessing. It's it's one of the biggest honors of my career to be a part of the franchise. Now I'm with... Matches Balloon. And... Bombay. And... Near Night. Wow, and great costumes, everybody. Nice uh, formal Batman outfit tonight, Batman. Thanks, Dave. It's good to be formal today. Why are you formal today? Well, because a friend of mine asked me to hold three of his Emmys. And I'm also going to be uh, judging the kids' contest for the cosplay, as well as the adults. I figured I'd look spiffy. And you do look spiffy. And look at, look at that beautiful bat tie. Yeah, it's spiffy with justice. I'm cosplaying as Xerophale from Good Omens. Oh, Good Omens. Yes, wow. Yeah, it's a TV show and a book series on uh, Amazon Prime. And this is his outfit when he's guarding the gates of Eden. That's fantastic. And, and, and did you make this yourself? I made everything myself, the embroidery, all the hand stitching, and then the wings are articulated. <laughs> and they're all real goose wings laid out in the exact format that they would be on a bird. So I'm being Wanda from WandaVision. And, and you made this yourself? This is actually uh, custom from ProCosplay.com. I'm much more makeup wig entrepreneur. I find it very hard to find costumes that like really speak to me in terms of like body shape and like characters that I love. So when WandaVision came out, I'm like, this is so good. And I just love the way she looks. Elizabeth Olsen's just very hot, so it's kind of hard to compete with that. <laughs> now I'm with Tom Arnold, and how are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? I'm loving your sidebirds. They're very long, as uh, sexy, it's sort of the 70s kind of thing. I'm enjoying Comic Con. Uh, I, everybody said Rhode Island is the best. People are very nice. I'm very excited. And how was it working on the Stupids film? It was fun because John Landis loves making movies. And you get a director that loves making movies. And it was based on children's books, you know, which I kind of read before. But I recently watched it again. My, I'm a single dad with an eight-year-old, a five-year-old. I watched it with my kids. And there's a lot to like of that. You know, if you like the stupids, you really like the stupids. And so there was a lot of fun in that. And also, you're close friends with Michael Rosenbaum. I gave him his big break. You know, I brought him out from uh, New York to be on 
the Tom show or Tom or one of my shows that was named after me. And he, he was amazingly talented. And he's my son's godfather. He's hilarious. We have many good memories together. And uh, I love Michael Rosenbaum. And he does these Comic Cons, you know, because he was Lex Luthor. I don't know if you know that in Smallville until he got he quit because he didn't want to shave his head anymore. But that happens to people. And what's one of your favorite movies you've ever worked on? I, I mean, people like True Lies. I liked it because we all stayed friends. I miss Bill Paxton, the great Bill Paxton. But we had a lot of fun making that. We all, which doesn't always happen. It was successful. Uh, but I always, I, I mean, there's a bunch of these movies I had a lot of fun with. And I'm reminded of that when my kids watch them. I'm now with Lou Ferrigno, and how are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? I'm excited to be back because of the pandemic last year. They didn't have this show. It was so nice to see everybody smiling, happy to get out, coming here after work, the instant gratification. It's such a joy. Tell me about your first meeting with Stan Lee. Well, I first met him when I came on the set. I remember they said there's a man named Stan Lee who wants to meet you. I said to myself, Stan Lee, it really is it, a person. I thought maybe it was a fictional writer in the comic book. So I met him, I shook his hand, he looked at me, he goes, why don't you work out sometime, look at you. And he had an odd sense of humor. I was so elated, I said to him, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be where I am, because thanks to you, because when I was a kid, 12, 13, I had to read the comic book, it said, written by Stan Lee. Did you know years ago, when he was young, when he told people at a party that he wrote, write comic books, people walked away from him? Yeah, it's all about passion. How did you enjoy, in the comics and the cartoon, because you voiced the Hulk, when he turned gr from green to gray? It was tough because you cannot interact with the other actors because you have to be directed in the microphone. So I had Mark Hamm, I had a whole bunch of people. So as we, uh, we almost try, almost try to get close to each other, we have to be directed in the microphone. The thing I like about it is that they built a cartoon by your voice. Years ago, you had to do it the other way around, which sometimes it didn't match the lip movement. That's why I was a kid, it was hard for me. But then when I did the new voiceover, it was such a pleasure. The Hulk was popular, hugely popular when you did it in the 1970s, but now it's even even more popular. What is the legacy of the Incredible Hulk? Well, every one of us has our little Hulk inside of us. So when we see the Hulk, it releases our tension. That's why the series is more popular than ever, because every episode had a laser compelling message about life. You learn something from the show. The new CGI, don't get me started, but the, like the original Twilight Zone. Even though today I watch every episode, we're talking about 60 years ago, the Hulk would be the same thing. And Bill Biggs would be fantastic, so you know, you want to embrace the guy. Okay, now I'm with Michael Myers, and how are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? He might be enjoying it, I'm not 100% sure. This might be the actual real Michael Myers. This might be, what do you have in your hand? Can you show me without stabbing me? Yeah, that's, that's, that's dangerous. I, I don't want to... Well, um, I think I saw Laurie Strode go that way, so I think, you, I think that's where you got to go. And that was Michael Myers. Now I'm standing with? The Night King. The Night King, wow. And uh, what brings you to Rhode Island Comic Con? I come every year, so I'm glad to be here. Tell me about your powers. What powers do you have? Resurrect the dead. Try, try to take over the world. Well, I can't believe it. I'm at Rhode Island Comic Con, but I'm not in the shadows. I'm in the light, but I'm with two of the stars of what we do in the shadows. And I'm with... Laszlo. And... Nadja. Wow. I can't believe you guys are out during the daylight. How did this happen? We stayed overnight. We came in last night and uh, hid out in our coffins and woke up early. And why is what we do in the shadows one of your favorite TV shows? I think we relate to the characters. <laughs> <laughs> it's just really funny and it's just really fun to watch and I think, uh, like you said, it's relatable but it's also just like fun to watch vampires in the modern age living on Staten Island. Like, it's just ridiculous and I don't know, I think everybody really likes the show. And now I'm with Richard Karn, and how are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? This is Rhode Island Comic Con After Hours. I don't think so, Richard. It's a good one. It was perfect. That's exactly where that should have been. I'm doing great. This is a really fun uh, 
I, the, the people that, that have come in for this are just fantastic. Home Improvement is one of the best sitcoms ever. And one of the, the, the best reasons for it was be the interrelationship between you and Tim. Tool Time was only a couple of minutes out of the show. You know, a lot of the times the show was just about the family and things like that. And then Tool Time would happen as a cold opening at the beginning or at the end or some, sometime in there. But Tim and I are doing a new show now on the History Channel called Assembly Required, soon to be retitled to More Power. Oh, ah. Was it easy to play the straight man to Tim? Yes. Before Home Improvement, I was usually the comic lead, you know, in the plays that I did. And when I met the producers, that's how they knew me. So when the audition for Home Improvement came up, they cast another guy because they wanted somebody very, very different from Tim. They wanted somebody older, somebody taller. That's why they got Stephen Topolowski. But when Stephen got a movie, they called me and said, you know, we need somebody to fill in for Stephen, and we know you're a good guy, and, and you wouldn't mind just doing the pilot. So when I started playing Al, I was playing a very, very different thing than, than I am normally. Now, they wrote to Tim. Tim just played himself. Did you know that I don't think so Tim was going to become the catchphrase that it became? I didn't understand the longevity of television in that sense. The I don't think so Tim came out of just a line, a throwaway line after one of Tim's jokes. I am just a guest star for the first two or three episodes. So Tim has a joke like, hey Al, you think they call it molding because it's been in the refrigerator too long? You know, and the audience laughs and I know I'm there to facilitate Tim and let him get that laugh. So I just let him have that laugh. And I didn't step on it, I didn't do anything, I just looked at him. And right before I'm about to say my next line, there was another laugh from the audience who saw this relationship with Tim and Al before we did, or before I did. And there was this laugh and I go, oh no, you know, in my head I'm going, I hope I didn't milk that, I hope I didn't, you know, uh, I wasn't asking for a laugh. And then I, I just kind of like stopped, let them laugh, and then I went, I don't think so, Tim. And that got another laugh. And the writers went crazy. They went, oh my God, now we know who these two people are. We don't need Stephen. We're going to keep you. I have to ask about Wilson, Earl, who passed away. You know, Earl wasn't originally cast. They, had a, they offered it to another guy whose agent calls them up and says, I understand my client isn't going to be seen. And they went, no, he's just going to be seen from the, you know, the nose up or whatever. And he goes, well, he doesn't want to do that. They went, oh, okay. And they got Earl. He loved the anonymity because he could sit there with me or with Tim and nobody would, would know who he was until he, ta he talked. Mm. Once he opened his mouth, they go, you're Wilson. Oh my God, you're Wilson. Yeah. So uh, I miss him. He was a great guy. He was a good guy to hang out with. How was it being the host of The Family Feud? It was so weird. It, it was, uh, you know. And so once I was on board, I was on board. I, you know, I... I jumped in with both feet and had a great time. It was a lot of fun. You don't know you can do something until you actually do it. This isn't something that you can train for or, you know, be prepared for. You just don't know. I'm now with Debbie Dunning, and how are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? It's, it's great. It's uh, very well organized, and we've got a lot of really good energy as um, in quite a few of these Comic Cons. I've been having a pretty good time. Great day. How does it feel that home improvement is thought of so well? You know, it's kind of, it's kind of nice. You, when you're working on the show, you're enjoying yourself, you're happy, you're you know, laughing all the time, and you're getting a really a lot of positive feedback. But like 20-something years later, people are like, it was the safest show for us to watch as a family. We'd watch it during dinner, and I remember that as a kid. I remember the shows we watched, and I'm glad that I could be part of that. Because, you know, when you're an actor, you... You basically just want to work, and then I ended up falling into this group um, as a different character, and then came back the next year and took over as the Tool Time Girl, and it's been, you know, amazing ever since. You were directed a lot of times by Peter Barnes. He was a very charismatic director, and he really trusted the actor and your instincts, and he was he was great. You know, there was a, there was a lot of different. Uh, directors, but for the first couple of years, he was fantastic. One episode where I believe you were pregnant in real life, your character gave birth. How was filming that episode? It was kind of one of those things where I almost felt like I gave birth twice because 
when you actually go through that, you're emotional and you feel it and you're like, oh my gosh, this is real. This is actually happening. It was emotional because I did not find out the sex of my daughter until she was born. The writers decided to make her a girl and it ended up being a girl. You know, it's funny, I should probably show her that episode. I don't really believe she's ever seen it. Um, but it was fantastic because two weeks later after filming that, I gave birth and it was a beautiful birth, Spencer Shea. She's almost 25. She's my best friend now. Wow, that's fantastic. Would you be up for a home improvement reunion movie? Of course. That's it. It's one of the best jobs I've ever had in my life. Some incredible friendships have been made. Look at Richard and I are still working together. And who was one of your favorite guest stars on the show? Alan Jackson is the first name that popped into my head. Uh, Rodney Dangerfield. I don't know. There was there was so many great talent that came and they wanted to do our show and made it so exciting. So now I produce a show called Debbie Dunning's Dude Ranch Roundup and I'm trying to do the same thing. I'm now standing with uh, Alex. Alex, and who are you dressed as today? Lando Calrissian. Oh, that's wonderful. And uh, did you make this costume? Uh, I did. Awesome. And what inspired you to just like Lando today? I really like his character. And I mean, there's not a lot of black characters from the original Star Wars movies, so I like him. And, and those are your favorite, the original movies? Yeah, I like the, those three, or four, five, and six. Now I'm standing with? sub -Zero. And? I'm just a rebel pilot from the Rebellion. Let's take a little closer look at that costume. Um, I did not make this. It was put together over time by buying it from Etsy, pieces from Etsy, like this is from Etsy, this is from Etsy, uh, this is from Amazon, like bits and pieces just put together and just, it came together as it goes. I'm still not done with the helmet. I got to do the weathering. And you get a blaster too. Yep, I actually do. I got that from Etsy too. I got this from one of my buddies that 3, uh, 3 printed it. I sanded it and painted it. A lot of it was all from Etsy, um, but, and then this was just one piece that was just sewn together from Etsy. So it's mostly Etsy and 3D printing. We're here at the Rhode Island Comic Con, and I'm with... David. David, and my name is... David. Also David. Do you know what David means in Hebrew, David? What does it mean? Beloved. Like both of us are. How are you enjoying Rhode Island Comic Con? Love it. It's nice to have some weather. I live in Los Angeles, so it's nice to have an excuse to wear a coat. And the fans are unbeatable, unmatched, unparalleled. Why? Rhode Island. How was your experience on The Office? Fantastic. I loved it. A lot of friends there. You know, I've known Steve Carell since 1991. And you go back to our Chicago days. So that was a fun ride, right? And as I met the rest of the cast, of course, I've known uh, Kate Flannery, who plays Meredith. I've known Kate for 30 years. So, you know, every time I'd go back, it seems like old home week. Did they let you improvise, or was it the script? No, no. I mean, every once in a while, you might offer a lineup. But remember, in television, it's a writer's medium. There's the number of pages you have and the number of minutes you have. The number of minutes you have is 23 and a half minutes. So if I decide to improvise a line, that means somebody else is going to lose a line in the show. Right? So it's not an oft-used exercise in the show when I was there. Now, I can't, I can't speak for everybody else's experience, but that's mine. And, and Anchorman, I'm sure you were a chance to improvise on that film. No, and Anchorman is a much different thing, because film's a different medium. So, and especially because you've got a director that comes from an improv background, Adam McCain. I've known Adam as well since 91. And of course, Will's a long-term -term improviser, as is Steve and myself, Paul as well. So what we would do is we'd film each scene three times, at least. So they were satisfied that they had it. The script was amazing. And then Adam would say, let the squirrel out of the bag. And then we'd go at it, you see. And you worked with Fred Willard. Yes, I love Fred. Oh, my God. One of the all-time greats. Yes. What a lovely man. His wife, Mary, was lovely as well. Who was some of your favorite comedy legends growing up? Well, I was a big fan of Abbott and Costello and the Marx Brothers growing up. And uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, the original cast of uh, Saturday Night Live. Uh, and what's one of your favorite roles that you've had outside The Office or Anchorman? Cheap Thrills. It's not for children. 15 and up, please. But it's a dark thriller with comedic undertones. That must have been a thrill to play. Ah, yes, David. Yes, David. Yes. Krampus is another one of my favorites. Have you seen Krampus? I have not. Come on, David. I'm sorry, David. I thought we were having some fun here. I thought we were friends, David. We are friends, David. Okay. So yes, we've got to see Krampus, especially now because it's the Christmas season coming up right around the corner. I call Krampus a holiday horror with humor and heart. It's for the whole family. There's two drops of blood in the entire horror movie.
Well, that was the 2021 Rhode Island Comic Con. As you can tell, it's an amazing event. I hope you come next year. My name is David Ciccarella. Thanks for watching.